Hello, my name is Marietta Kozma, and I'm going to be presenting the paper called Uncanny Compulsions in Pauline Hopkins of One Blood or the Hidden Cell. The work of Pauline Hopkins of One Blood or the Hidden Cell is vital in constructing a national and post-national consciousness. And it is in line with the project of W.E.V. Du Bois, who situated the African-American strife in the discourse of international concern. Hopkins of One Blood had a central role in the colored magazine where it was published, as it dealt with the question of how to engage, represent, and position Black Americans in a globalizing world that was becoming more heterogeneous, more vast, more integrated than it was in the 19th century. So in the early 1900s, the problem of the color line was pertinent. Hopkins helps the readers come into terms with their own racial standing. Individuals struggle with the notion of double consciousness which is basically being both Black and African-American. Another struggle that I will address is a common practice of Black nationalist discourse, the exclusion of the experiences of Black women from dominant discourse. The threat of getting sexually assaulted was a reality and, at the same time, a form of social control of the Black female body. This is confirmed by Angela Davis, Rape was the most common manifestation against black, the Black female body. Therefore, an intersectional analysis through the vectors of class, race, and gender is necessary. The title of One Blood or the Hidden Self is significant. Uh, <clears throat> the first part of the title invokes more of an essentialist notion of racial identity, something that is rather fixed. Whereas the second part wavers towards a model of racial identity that is fluid, indeterminate and socially constructed. Therefore, the notion of the head and self conveys less of a sense, uh, a sense of fluid interdeterminacy than a compulsory race memory. So it basically shows something that can change. A little bit out of context for this novel. So Raul Briggs is a medical student uh, who's contemplating suicide. He had a vision uh, of a fair face frame, golden hair. He encounters this woman of his dreams, Deante Lust, at a concert. Deante is the lead singer of the Jubilee Sisters. Raul brings her back to consciousness after she had been killed in a train accident. She has lost her memory and Raul decided to consciously hide, uh, hide from her her racial longings. Uh, she was unaware of her racial standing as, and I'm quoting here, the auntie was not in any way the preconceived idea of a Negro. Fair as the fairest woman in the hall, with wavy bands of chestnut hair and great melting eyes of brown, soft as those of childhood, a willy figure of exquisite mold. It was very pretty, and because her skin was pale, no one uh, could really understand or, I guess, guess her race. The Amphi could easily pass as white. <clears throat> whiteness was viewed as an excess. She was more susceptible to violence as a black female, and especially because her body embodied the distinctiveness of the characteristics which were rendered as more desirable. For example, the wavy hair, uh, the slender nose, the white skin. Uh, in addition, her standing as a lead singer is very important. Deontay Lusk was the soloist, the head of the band Jubilee Sisters. And through this engagement of hers with singing, uh, she was able to put at the forefront what it means to be Black. 
as a soloist, she's able to put forward uh, how she experiences her own positionality. She functions as a connected tissue between America and Africa, carrying with her and exposing the trauma of Black, Black U.S. history and heritage. The Amphi exposes the oppression that Black women were facing during the 20th century in relation to the societal roles they needed to fill through the lyrics that she's singing. So the Amphi, for example, uh, exposes the stereotypes of uh, the mummy or the Jezebel. So women, uh, Black women have traditionally been either over-sexualized or rendered as sex, sexless creatures. They existed in both ends, at both ends of the continuum. By being there for the lead singer of the Jubilee Sisters, the Antha's familial and political connections to her African American ancestry are revealed. Her voice expresses, and I'm quoting here, all the horror, the degradation from which a race had been delivered were in the plain strains of the singer's voice. It strained the senses of the listener almost beyond endurance. She sung the awfulness of the hell from which people had been happily plucked. She functions as a connective tissue between America and Africa, exposing the trauma of Black youth history, as I mentioned before. Uh, we need to mention here that the auntie was married to her own brother, Raul, without even being aware of their incestuous relationship. She was physically abused, not only by Raul, but also by her other half-brother, Aubrey. So we see that violence is primarily addressed on the Black female body. The auntie, uh, is personally and collectively um, experiences trauma, I'm sorry, both uh, individually and collectively. As uh, not only has she suffered uh, from violence against her own body, but she also becomes aware of the sexual victimization of her foremothers, for example, of her foremother, um, Myra, who appears later in the novel and exposes uh, the, the incestuous relationship that Dianca has formed with uh, Raul, her brother. So the idea of resistance is central uh, in this narrative of One Black, and it's also very important in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement. So even though it belongs to a different era, as of one blood has been written in the early 20th century, we see that it resonates a lot with this contemporary movement. As the Alfie, through her positioning as the lead singer of the Jubilee Sisters, is able to create collective and presumably liberatory spaces like Black Lives Matter does, producing an unpredictable intimacy. Sarah Ahmed is one of the critics that has challenged the idea of emotions as a private matter because they effectively flow among bodies, objects, and signs, forming sticky attachments that impact both the making of individual subjects and their movement throughout collective and social spaces. So basically, the individual turns into something collective. However, um, a criticism that I would personally like to pose is towards this uniformity of the collectivity of the Black Lives Matter movement, as even though it claims to be liberatory, it is a fix on the perpetuation of violence. And even though anybody can be located at the center of this dialectic of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, as a new space for ex of existence for these bodies that were previously excluded from hegemonic discourse opens up, they are still excluded, like the Anthe. Uh, through performing the lyrics of her songs, the Anthe manages to challenge this collectivity, which reiterates systemic violence, and she's able to 
come to their forefront as an individual. Pianti is able to challenge the collectivity of the community in which she belongs and treats her shared experiences with the Black community by exposing endurance. By notion of endurance, uh, I mean that she needs to endure the hardships and the legacy of slavery in order to survive and pertain her own life. She consciously does not speak much and she seems to depend on others. She was almost in an infantilized state in the beginning as she did not really react and she exposed the symptoms of hysteria. Hysteria has primarily been uh, theorized as a white uh, illness. However, we see that Hawkins employs it in order to de deconstruct this assumption. So we have, we shall consider, and who is the anti stance that she takes this non violent stance? Whether it is necessary to resort to violence in order to influence social change, or could, should change happen through the employment of non violent tactics of resistance, such as the anti tactic, adopting silence after her accident. So an interesting point is that this practice of nonviolence, which is exhibited through endurance, is often misperceived as a practice that encompasses passivity to contest a particular form of power. However, this is not true. Nonviolence in the form of silence can be just as powerful in inflicting change as it tackles the very structure of systemic violence. So the anti employs endurance and is compliant to her sexual man manipulation in order to survive. It is important to note that not only the anti, but also real big suffers from his racial longing due to her color of his skin. He also manages to pass as white and he oscillates between his whiteness and blackness. And what is significant is that when he travels to Ethiopia, he, because he was appointed as King uh, Ergamimis, he meets Queen Candace, which is who functions as the Antis quote. So we see this other female figure who is, uh, does look like the Anti, but also like differentiates from her. So we see that they bear like a painful resemblance, they look alike. Uh, just the difference is that Queen Candace is like a statue of bronze. She has like more of a bronze skin and she has long jet black hair, totally free, but were totally free and covered her shoulders like a silken mantle. And we see that she has thick black eyebrows and great black eyes. So she was very beautiful. So all in all, we see that um, uh, race is just a construct, the social convention. And therefore the formation of a collectivity of the experiences of people across the United States um, shall be questioned. So by contextualizing Pauline Hopkins' work, by exposing the era through, within which it emerged and connecting it to the present era of the Black Lives Matter, signals of the construction of a larger discourse with high with political and sociological implications. So Pauline Hopkins of One Blood could be viewed as a highly political text. Uh, the practices of rape and, and miscegenation are still prevailing problems that undermine the democratic practices of the United States. So one uh, shall consistent, shall, I'm sorry, consider whether it is necessary to resort to violence in order to affect social change or whether can change happen through the employment of nonviolent tactics of resistance. 
for example, as the practice of silence that the NLP has employed. The institution of slavery for sure has affected the way in which relations are formed in the contemporary era, as Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement does not exist in a vacuum. Its predecessors have been the civil rights movement and the Black Power movement that also seek uh, equity. So the ending of the novel brings to the forefront this connection between the strife of the individual on the personal and on the political level as overt acts of violence towards Black women extend to this larger discourse of the community. Systemic violence threatens Black women's wholeness. And even though the practices of racial exclusion and civilization largely largely differ in each generation, the outcome of racial violence basically has largely really remained the same. These are some of the references that I have used for my paper. And thank you very much. <laughs>